everyone, and welcome to Inside Unreal, our weekly show where we learn, explore, and celebrate everything Unreal together. I'm your host, Victor Broden, and with me today, I have developer relations technical artist, Aaron Langmead. Welcome to the studio. Hello. Um, and we're going to cover some version control. We are. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's version control, not source control, is what I learned through my research. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can call it whatever you want, really, but... I guess yeah. so, but source specifically... Uh, retains two, you know, like source files, which is text-based. Sure. Uh, we have the ability to merge them relatively easily, mm -hmm. and you can work with them a little bit differently than you can with, say, a binary file, mm -hmm. like like a US and such. Yeah. Um, but I think without further ado, I mean, it's your first time on the stream, so yes. you know, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, Thank you very much. Yeah, it's great to have you here. It's great uh, to be here. Visiting from the UK, which is actually where you're uh, located, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So if you guys have any questions uh, and you're over in the UK, try to find Aaron uh, at any of the meetups. I think you go to a couple of them. I try to if mm -hmm. I can. Uh, I've changed job recently, so I'm actually the evangelist for the UK you now. You did tell me that. So uh, yeah, if you're, you know, kind of, I'm going to be trying to reach out to more people soon. Kind of start talking to the indies and trying to help them out as much as I can. Just trying to build that stuff up. Yeah, that's, should that's, be good. That's great. All right. I think let's go ahead and talk a little bit about version control. Awesome. OK, first off, we had lots of fun coming up with kind of sub names <laughs> for, or subtitles for, for this talk. Uh, but we did go with don't be a git, use the perforce in the end. Use the force. Which I quite like. It's good. Um, so yeah, we're going to be talking about uh, a few different setups um, today. We're going to be talking about kind of setting up something on a cloud server, setting up something for more kind of personal internal use on a local host. Um, and then we're going to be kind of diving into the engine and talking about ways that you can uh, you know, kind of break up your project or just be able to better manage um, all of your assets so that you're not running into checkout issues, which is what we find that a lot of teams, especially as they start scaling up, tend to find they run into. Uh, so we'll go through that stuff. Uh, and then we'll finish off with a quick summary and, and then, I guess, Q&A. And Sounds good. Yeah, lots of fun. Um, so this slide is wrong, which is great. <laughs> good start. Because yeah, yeah, you got to start off with a with a wrong slide. There's actually four different uh, methods of version control that we have uh, as of four twenty four, I think. Mm -hmm. So we've recently added plastic, which is kind of an, an slight, a newer version of uh, version control, which a lot of people are finding really useful. Uh, we are going to be going over two key ones today, which is uh, subversion and perforce. And we'll talk a little bit about why uh, we're not going to be going over Git. Um, so kind of pros and cons of each of those tools. Git is absolutely amazing for programmers. It's you know kind of what most coders are going to want to use. But for artists, it, it really sucks. Uh, <laughs> so the main reasons for that is uh, you'll often run into file size limits or size limits for assets, things like that. So if you're an artist, you're often working with, you know, kind of reasonably large files, mm -hmm. especially, you know, kind of even inside the engine, if you're, you know, kind of working on the U asset, those, those files can still get pretty big and the maps can get, can get big as well. So we tend to find, especially on the kind of the, the free or, you know, kind of very low cost uh, signups for any, any Git accounts that, you'll very quickly run into just a, a, a data cap that, that you have to pay to get past or you, or you can't get through. Um, and the, the second big reason that kind of Git can suck for, for artists and designers, people working inside the engine, is that you can't check out any assets. Right. right? So if you aren't used to working in a version control tool, uh, generally, you want to be able to check out assets because you want to stop other people from being able to work on them while you're working on them. Because you don't want to have two different versions of the same texture or model or asset uh, that you then have to try and decide who should uh, get you know kind of pushed through to the to the main. Right. Main you have to sort of manage that outside of the, yeah. the version control tool, and that can lead to to lots of issues. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, unlike uh, unlike code. You can't merge those things, so things back in. So one of the things that Git is is good at is 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 being able to merge code together. So if you know you have two uh, two people working on you know kind of the same 
kind of blocks of code or same areas of code, it's a lot easier for them to bring those uh, bring that work back together. Mm -hmm. um, whereas you can't do that for binary files. You know, it's like if you're working on a texture and you just had two people working on it. And then at the end, you had to just alpha blend out the bits that you wanted to keep from one <laughs> artist and the bits from the other. Like it, it just uh, it just doesn't work. So, so we have two other versions: uh, Subversion and Perforce. Subversion is great because it's uh, it's cheap or it's free. So there's no kind of uh, limit on how many users you can have. Uh, it, you just can download a Subversion, you know, kind of manager like Tortoise, and then. All you have to do is pay for hosting if you want to do that, you know, kind of online on a cloud somewhere, uh, or you can host it locally on a on a on a NAS or on your computer or you know, kind of uh, anything that can that can set up a subversion uh, host. The downsides to that uh, are that we have no tie to a subversion build of the engine. So unlike with Git, um, where you can kind of Grab a grab a copy of the engine and the different versions of the engine that we have, and you know, kind of uh, change those, iterate them. You can even send us code uh, if you found a bug that we can then pull, you know, kind of pull back into our into our main uh, main build. With Subversion, we don't have that. So your kind of your engine build and your uh, and your game build. You know, you either need to separate them by having your a Git repo for the engine and Subversion repo for the actual game that you're building, um, or just you know, kind of create a copy of the engine, mm -hmm. bring that into your Subversion folder, and then you manage. You'd have to manage that yourself, and then when you wanted to upgrade, you'd have to again, you know, kind of manage that uh, that yourself. Uh, also, it you know looks like something that Zero Call would use, which is you know, if you haven't seen the film Hackers, uh, you know, kind of just. Leave the stream right now. Go and watch that <laughs> film because uh, it's absolutely awesome in it. Yes, that is Angelina Jolie. If you haven't uh, seen it before, uh, so yeah, go and watch Hackers. Just a little side note. Uh, then we have uh, Perforce. Perforce is pretty much the industry standard. I don't know any studios that are using uh, that are using Subversion, um, mainly just because. Perforce is, you know, kind of it's it's a more cleaned up package. It's mm -hmm. more complete. It's you know got uh, kind of different levels of support and hosting, and it's just a bit more uh, fully featured. But uh, you know, kind of for for small groups, for single users, Subversion is is absolutely great. It's fine. It's, there's there's nothing wrong with it. Um, but Perforce is the kind of the standard tool that industry is using. So if you are a student and you're wanting to get into the games industry, having an understanding of how Perforce works is is a really useful skill to be able to, you know, kind of be able to just say, yeah, I know how to do that. Yeah. You won't be doing any catch up when you join the studio. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's great. It supports checkout, which is one of the kind of the key things that we're looking for uh, as in-engine users. Uh, it does tie to the engine. There is a kind of a small caveat with that, which is that you do have to be a custom licensee in order to get access to the Perforce version of um, of you know kind of the engine builds that we su we supply. Uh, it has a very clean interface, so it's nice and easy to use. It's built up. It's uh, it's yeah, and it's it's very it's very good. And then on the con side of that, no chance of looking like zero call, unfortunately, because you know you're not really going to be in any kind of uh, command line for for most of it. Um, it's potentially expensive at scale, so it's free for up to five users, I yep, think. That's great. Uh, so as soon as you kind of get past the five users, then you will have to start looking at uh, licensing it with uh, through you know through through Perforce. Uh, so yeah, and then obviously the the downside con, which is the it ties to the engine, but again, that's only with a custom license. Uh, so we're going to very quickly run through two methods of setting up. Uh, subversion on a NAS, uh, so a, a kind of just a network storage device that you can buy. They're really, really cheap. Um, it's really, uh, really useful because it's kind of like a one-off cost. So mm -hmm. whereas with, you know, kind of if you wanted to do any cloud hosting, you're looking at paying, um, you know, kind of a price, a set price uh, every single month. So for some people that might not be uh, not might not be useful if you're kind of just a hobbyist or you're just wanting somewhere to store your you know kind of your art projects that you're working on in your free time or something like that. Uh, so this can be a really really useful way of doing that. 
Uh, just a, another caveat as well with these two setups, we have done these in advance. The reason being that when you're setting the, the, uh, your kind of subversion, your Perforce server up, they are very, very open to attack until you've secured them. So if we did this live, there is a very good chance that, you know, we could have people, you know, kind of messing it up on the stream. So because, you know, they love having that fun. Uh, there is a good chance that we could get it even, you know, kind of with what we have at the moment. And if we do, I feel like that's just a good lesson for everyone on network security and just making sure you're, <laughs> you're set up. So we'll be going through most of these on uh, just just through PowerPoint, but the actual in uh, engine stuff we'll, we'll do live and crazy. Mm -hmm. So uh, first off, uh, this is the kind of the NAS that I used to set it up, uh, set it up with. You're free to use, um, you know, kind of other forms. I chose this one because it has a uh, SVN uh, subversion application built into the actual NAS itself. So it's got a really nice, easy uh, user interface. It's very, very quick and easy to set up. Um, so yeah, you can go on Synology. They've got multi-bay station setups as well. So you plug in more than one hard drive, and then it will run off one, but it will mirror, mm -hmm. uh, which gives you kind of a redundancy in case anything goes wrong. So again, it's really useful just for making sure you're not actually going to lose any data. Um, I'm sure most of you will have lost data at some, some point, point or something. So having something like this where you've got a an actual backup and then if you do double uh, disks, then you can have multiple backups. So even if that hard drive backup fails, you've got an exact copy waiting right next to you that you can just switch into. Uh, so this is the user interface. So uh, again, it's it's really simple to set up. You buy your NAS, you plug it in, uh, you plug it into your uh, into a you know kind of Ethernet port, and then um, you just have to log in. There's all these instructions, you know, kind of very, it's very easy instructions on how to actually log into it. Uh, one thing I will say about this is that this is going to be local only on your, uh, on your internet connection, right? So on your local uh, Wi-Fi or, uh, or whatever. If you want to be able to access this outside of the, uh, outside of, you know, kind of your local space, you'll have to get a static IP or something similar that allows you to access uh, this. You can get like a DDNS, or um, there's actually a thing that's built into the Synology, which is like a quick link. Um, but I'm not sure if that works with the uh, SVN server, so you'd have to you'd have to check that. Um, if you are really interested in doing game dev, uh, or if you're you know kind of you've got a small studio, you should have a static IP. Anyway, if you're interested in doing, you know, kind of console development, because there is a there is a requirement to have a, a static IP for some of the the console uh, for console development. So you go onto the package center, you download the SVN um, kind of app that's kind of built in, and then once you've installed it, it's really really easy to do it. You just open it up, you add to create a new repo. Uh, I've added one here called my first SVN. You edit that repo and you go to user and then you add all the users you want. So I've added myself and I've added Victor uh, so he can help me out on some project stuff. I like to be able to put Victor to work. It's good, you do good stuff, so it's, it's useful. I'm, uh, I'm here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I will be putting you to work later on in the show. So <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be good. Uh, so you add your users, you add the passwords, um, and then you are you are done. Like your actual server is up and running. You have mm -hmm. a SVN. So now all you need to do is access it. Uh, and for that, um, most people use Tortoise SVN, which is the ugliest, most '90s-looking application. But I it think works. I've ever seen. But it works so well that I think people have just been like, "Well, it works. Uh -huh. So there's no point in doing anything that looks prettier." Um, so yeah, download and install SVN. Uh, and then inside, uh, you know, kind of your desktop, you create a new folder, uh, wherever, you know, kind of wherever you like, you can put it in the Unreal Projects folder, you can put it at this, uh, at the, you know, kind of core C drive, if you've got a data drive, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, open it up and then right click inside there. If you've installed Tortoise, uh, with the You'll, default settings, I believe. Just with the default yeah. settings, yeah. You just let it let it install, um, and then if you right click, you'll get two new tabs open up: SVN checkout and Tortoise SVN. If you go into that and press import, uh, it will then give you a little tab. Again, we've hidden the IP here, um, 
but you basically put in your tab, so it's svn colon backslash backslash IP address, uh, and then it's the um, the port that you need to be able to access it through. Again, if you have a static IP and you want to be able to access it, you'll need to port forward uh, 3690, which is the standard uh, SVN port for the uh, for the Synology NAS, uh, and then um, backslash my first SVN, and that will then uh, it will then find that and you'll have access to it. So you'll be able to do all your uh, content edition, checking out um, any of that stuff. Anything that you put in that folder, you'll be able to mark it for ads, you'll be able to push it, you'll be able to pull new content, and that will all get managed inside Tortoise. Uh, and then you'll be able to set up that link inside Unreal as well. So we'll go over the uh, Unreal link mm -hmm. uh, on the Perforce side, because it's, um, it's, it's pretty much exactly the same. And that's it. So if you want like just a little, really nice and easy, it's like 100, 200 quid to buy uh, a NAS, and then you've got it as a backup, it's, you're, you're done. Um, so it's, again, it's really good for if you just want a little personal project space where you can push stuff to it that's not on your actual main desktop, um, that you just want to be able to you know, have that kind of the power of version control, but on a, on a small setup, then this is a really nice, quick and easy way of just getting that, that done. Uh, so are we good on that? Do you want to do, wanna do some quick questions? I think or so. should we just um, move on to the Perforce? I'm going to paste a link to the documentation as well, because mm -hmm. we do have some official documentation regarding SVN yes. and the use of the, uh, yeah. of the engine. Um, from what I remember using Taurus, it is very straightforward. It's, and it's so simple. We yeah. are going to go over some of the fundamental concepts uh, now using Perforce, yeah. sort of how you actually work with source control. And that's pretty much agnostic. There will be different menus, um, mm -hmm. but the terms are very similar. Um, and yeah. you should be able to apply that even if you're using Tortoise. Yeah. Uh, OK, so uh, setting up Perforce. So uh, this is just a really nice and simple. I try to keep both of these as simple as possible. This is based off uh, the very well-known Alar. Alar. Who's a friend of the show. Is he a friend of the show? Of course, he's, he's a, a moderator. He's a friend of the show. We love, we yeah. love Alar. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is, uh, this is uh, based on his tutorial. It's, it's almost identical. I've updated a few things because uh, this one's a little bit old now. So it's just referencing some old files that don't, uh, don't work anymore. Uh, I think he's got a pull request on there. Alar, if you're watching. Uh, take that pull request. Um, but yeah, so uh, just one thing with this, uh, if you are wanting to set up a Perforce server, you want to use DigitalOcean, go on to Alar's blog. I've got the link in here. Uh, if you use his link, then he gets um, like a, dis uh, a reference discount. So it gives him some credit for his DigitalOcean account. So he's done all the hard work on here. So you know, go on his uh, go on his website. Make sure you use his link for the DigitalOcean thing. Give him a few free credits. It doesn't cost you anything. It's you know, it's a nice thing to do. Yeah. Uh, so, what you need to do is you need to go to DigitalOcean. This is just a, a hosting service website. Um, set up your account. You can do it with Google. You can do it with GitHub. You can uh, you can make whatever you want. Uh, once you've done that, go create a new project. Um, choose Ubuntu. Uh, this is where the the projects uh, may change. So we're currently on 18.4.3. Uh, so you need to make sure that, you know, if you're watching this somewhere down the line and we're on Ubuntu 24 point whatever, you'll need to make sure that the Perforce version that you're grabbing is matching that number, because uh, otherwise you'll, you'll run into issues. Uh, so you can choose a standard plan, uh, and then you pick the kind of the monthly uh, cap that you want to be working to. Um, I've been kind of I, this is so this is the setup that I use for for a lot of my personal stuff. I very rarely go over eight nine dollars a month um, of just me working inside the engine. So I'm careful with what stuff I'm pushing up there because I want to keep it reasonably cheap. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not. Depending on how big your project is and how much stuff you're moving back and forth, it can be it can be really cheap to to have it on. Uh, so pick the you know kind of the it's got CPU list, it's got SSD size, it's got uh, transfer uh, speeds and things like that. So uh, just pick the one that's going to work for your project. You can change this um, you know kind of as you go. So it's uh, it's it's nice and easy to do. So once you've got that. 
that's your server setup, but the server's currently empty, right? There's nothing that's in it, so you can't really do much with it. Uh, so what we need now is we need um, we need a thing called Putty. Uh, this lets you access uh, the server through kind of like a command line. So you, you'll need this in order to be able to talk to the server and tell it to do things, tell it to install uh, particular files. So if you just search for Putty, it'll be the first thing that comes up. Um, we can add a link as well, I'm sure, later on at some point. Um, so download that. Uh, install it, open it up, and then uh, what it will do when you uh, when you open it, it'll ask you to enter in the host. Uh, and at that point, you need to put in the uh, the server that you've created. You'll get an email which will have the server IP address and the password that you can use. You log in as root, and then you enter the password that it's given you. As soon as it gives you that password and you've entered it, it'll ask you to put in a new one. So you'll need to change that password straight away. And then we've managed to get the, uh, the actual code down to these four lines of code. So once you've logged in and it's all your password's been changed and it's waiting for commands, all you need to do is copy and paste each of these lines one by one uh, into your, uh, into your uh, putty uh, command line, and it will set up all of the Perfor stuff for you. So it's... It's yeah, it's it's foolproof because I've been able to do it, <laughs> and if I can do it, then you know anyone can. Yeah, do I think it. it took me like twenty minutes. It's so yeah, yeah, it's so quick. So so just to run, give you a, a very brief overview of what each line of code's doing. If you're not, uh, if you're not, you know, kind of uh, very code centric. So the first one is just telling the server to update, um, which you'll need to do because uh, uh, some of the uh, command stuff that we get it to do inside that wget. Um, it, it isn't able to do. Uh, so it, you need to update the server first. So you run that command, then you get, uh, all that's doing is it's retrieving the content at that uh, repo address. So mm -hmm. we've got, uh, I've made a copy of, uh, again, this is all from Alar's stuff. Um, he's the smart guy here who's done this, not me. I take no credit. Um, all I've done is I've just updated the, um, the Perforce version that it needs to get to set up the server. So you grab that again. Uh, please don't just blindly download random stuff. Like look through the code first and, and check it before you do it. Don't trust me or don't trust anyone, <laughs> just as a general rule. Uh, but you should look through the code first just to make sure that you're happy with it and you know, it's, it's not doing anything that you're not, uh, you're not happy with. Uh, the ch mod is just navigating to the particular address. And then the uh, sudo install perforce is actually installing the perforce server. Once you set it going, it will run. Uh, it will ask you to set up another password. This is for a sub account. Um, this is because you don't want to be working off your root login. Um, that's just a standard kind of security thing that's a good mm -hmm. idea to do. So it will create a secondary login that's called perforce, I think. Uh, set up a password for that press enter and then it will carry on and then it will all be finished. And then at that point you have your very own Perforce server ready to go, uh, which you can access from anywhere, right? As long as you've got an internet connection. Yes, <laughs> internet in is important. <laughs> With an internet connection, yeah. Uh, so at that point all you need is the software to, for you to be able to interact with that. So at that point go on to Perforce's website, you want to go to P4V, uh, you'll need to do some registration, uh, some registration stuff for that, because um, obviously it does have the five user limit. Um, once you've done that, you choose your family, your format, your uh, your platform, download, uh, and then you'll be able to install uh, the P4V. So it's a suite of uh, of apps. These are the kind of the three ones that you'll use. It can also install a command line that you can access as well if you. Uh, comfortable using a command line because some people aren't, some people aren't. Uh, you don't have to install it. Um, you can you can just leave it off. Um, but if you like using command line, if you prefer it over that uh, over using visual interfaces, um, then you can install that one as well. Um, but we get P4 admin, P4 merge, and P4v. So P4 admin is where you'll be setting up your depots, uh, adding your users, and managing the. Uh, all of the repositories as a whole. Uh, P4V is where you'll be doing most of your pushing, pulling, syncing, uh, you know, kind of um, shelving, branching, mm -hmm. all of that stuff. 
And then P4 Merge is a specialist tool that you'll be using if you do want to start merging content together. So that's as we talked about before, if you if you branch two versions off and you want to bring those two together, it's got kind of a specialist tool that makes that stuff uh, a bit easier to We're do. We're going to talk a little bit more about merging. We are going to talk yeah. a little bit. We've seen quite a lot of questions about branching and merging, uh, so we'll try and we'll try and tackle those a little bit later on. Uh, so this is on the admin page, uh, and again, this is why we haven't just set this up um, live. So once you have your connection, you set up your uh, Perfil server, you need to access it. So you do that by adding your IP address, uh, and then it's the um, the 1666, which is your uh, the port for Perfil. So that's a standard port that it uses for, for it. Um, and then you'll press the new button, and this is the thing that anyone who has this uh, IP address can add themselves as a user because the Perfil server, when it gets first installed, is not secured uh, yeah, with any password open. requirement, uh, with any user lockdown uh, level. So literally anyone who has this IP can then go and make a new user. Uh, feel free to go and try and make a user with that now <laughs> if you want. <laughs> um, but it should it should be locked down. Um, so yeah, you want to uh, set this up, make a new user, add yourself to it. Um, when you first log in, it will set you up as the super user, mm -hmm. and then you'll be able to add new users and, and add the security level to it so that random people can't just access your You're talking about content. doing it live on the stream, <laughs> and then we realized that if someone's quick on the keyboard and know yeah. what they're doing, you might start <laughs> we seeing some strange things being um, I kind of wanted to let I kind of wanted to yeah. let it happen as well. Cause <laughs> I thought it'd be funny to just have like just a, Come a work community on the project. Yeah. community driven, but God, that would have just gone so wrong so quickly. <laughs> that it's just not going to happen. There are a couple of things that could happen yeah. there. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, you you uh, add your uh, IP address, create your new user, and then this will give you access to P4 admin. So here we can add our new users. So we have a thing called users and groups. Uh, so we can add all of our uh, you know, kind of, I've added Victor to this so he can access it. Uh, and then we also want to do a bit of security stuff as well. So under administration, we can go in and we can change the password security level. So by default, uh, it's set to it's set to zero, which seems like a, just a really bad idea. Uh, so passwords not required. I recommend setting this up as as high as you're able to go. Um, again, it. We don't want to provide too much stuff on security advice. Just you know, kind of some. Do your research. Just yeah, yeah. You should look into this stuff yourself. You should figure out what uh, level of security you're comfortable with. Um, but yeah, it's it's up to you. Um, but yeah, we you know we go quite high on on what we want. If you can get two-factor authentication, it's you know it's always a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, so set your password security level up. Um, so you know, kind of a password is always required to get access into into the. Uh, into P4 and P4 admin. Um, and then uh, what we want to do is stop uh, anyone from being able to make a user. So this is the one bit of, uh, well, there's another bit of command line, but this is the main bit of command line that you'll need to use. Uh, so it's just this little strip here, P4 configure set dm.user.noautocreate equals two. This basically just means that uh, Perforce will stop anyone from being able to make a new user unless that's being done inside P4 admin. So at that point, only your admins can make new users, which it's a good thing. It's a good way to go. <laughs> yeah, let's yeah, we should just do it that way. You should get this bit of code um, afterwards once you press enter. That's how you know that it's uh, it's set up and it's and it's working and you've you've locked that down. So the next thing that we need to do is add our uh, add our uh, add our depot. So we have uh, you can have as many different depots as you want. Uh, these are basically your kind of uh, your base directories for any of your projects that you're working on. Um, we've got two different key types that you can that you can have that I'm going to be talking about: uh, local and stream. So local is a nice and simple one. Uh, it's basically just here's my game, you know, kind of super game 55 or whatever, and that's all that this thing has got in it. It's just a repository for for, my, for that game's content. Then you have streams, uh, which are a little bit more complex. Um, and basically what they are is multiple projects within a single depot. But those things can be uh, can have dependency on one another. So 
inside uh, most of the engine stuff that, that we have, we'll have the engine, and then inside the, uh, the actual engine, we'll have all of the games and samples and various bits that we need. And then those will be each set up as a stream. And what's quite nice about that is you can set up interdependency. So you can say, oh, I just want this particular project. And it will pull just that project, but it will also pull anything that it needs in order for that project to work. So this is quite useful if you have content that you need to share across multiple projects, like the engine build, mm -hmm. if you're doing a custom build of the engine. Uh, and that way, you can have your engine build, all your different projects. But when you pull that content, you don't have to pull everything or manually specify the things that you want to pull. You can just pick a particular stream, work in that stream, and then uh, and then switch between them as, as you need. Uh, so if you're kind of just starting out on this stuff, just stick with local. It's nice and easy. Um, just you know, kind of make it for your game project. If you're, uh, if you're more advanced, you probably already know about this already, uh, but maybe take a look at streams, especially if you want to set up your own engine, uh, engine build. So that is it. We have now got a Perforce server, as well as a subversion server. He's busy. Yay. Yay. Nice and easy. And this has been cooking all night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and now compile shaders. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so now we're going to go over kind of adding that project. And we're going to do this. We'll try to do this live and see how that goes. So we have uh, a little example project here. So this is based off the, uh, the vehicle game. Um, so we're going to go through kind of setting up a workspace in P4V. Uh, so I'll just open up P4V, bring that down. So this is the, you know, kind of what you'll be working in day to day. Um, you have basically your your depot and your workspaces, right? So the the depot, this is the server versions of these files. So this is what you've got on your server, and then your workspace is the local um, saved version of that. So you're pulling that stuff down. Uh, downloading it and storing it locally so that you can work on it and, and edit it. I guess it might be good to mention sort of the difference between, just iterate a little bit on the difference between your local copy of everything that exists and what exists on the server, the depot, right? Mm -hmm. um, and how that you can pretty much do anything you want on your end in yes. your workspace. Um, but it's only when you decide to actually push it back to the server that anyone else will get either, yay, you're now bug fixes, or <laughs> yeah, nay, you're, yeah. you're bugs. Yeah, you can go through and you can do whatever you want to this. Um, you can check stuff out. You don't even need to technically check stuff out. You can manually overwrite it. Mm -hmm. So one of the really useful things about uh, Perforce is that when you set this up, it will manually set almost everything to, um, to read only. And that way, you can't edit the files by default. You can only view and access them. And then when you check those out, it's manually switching that over so you can start editing it. So it, it tries to keep it so that you're, you're only working on the content that you've actually pulled and you've marked out as yours. And then the really useful thing out, about that is um, if you want to work on the AI, the behavior tree for the little character that we've made, right? you can then check that out. And then I can't go in and start editing that. It will notify me if I try and check it out that you've already got it. There's a little icon that comes up that lets you know and who's got it checked out. Um, so I can either let you get on with your work, or I can go and shout at you to be like, put it back in because I need it. And I'm more important than you, right. so, so I need to work on it more. And then you can, you can do it. But I think we should also mention sort of the setup of which files you are actually supposed to push to the server. Yes. Because in your project folder, you do have um, a couple of folders that should only exist locally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, absolutely. And we, we do have documentation on this as well. I will go ahead and link that and put it yeah. in the form afterwards. Uh, but if you want to go through mm -hmm. uh, which ones that might be. Yeah, we'll do, we'll do those. So, so what you uh, will set up, and we'll go through setup for this as well, uh, is a .p4 ignore file. Uh, and what this is, if you've used um, any version control stuff, you've probably come across this before. But basically, what it does is it marks any uh, assets and file types and folders to be ignored by the version control system. So when you make uh, your project, so I'll just open up the project file here, uh, it builds a load of content that you don't want to be pushing to the server because it's just local content that you're, uh, that you're building. So these are the uh, intermediate and saved folders. You don't necessarily want to be deleting them, um, but you definitely don't want to be pushing them mm -hmm. uh, back up to, to there. Uh, the one reason is that those files can get huge. 
Like you're, uh, if you are currently working on bug fixing and you're generating a lot of logs, uh, those logs, if you've got like an error that's happening every single tick, mm -hmm. uh, that's creating a file and those files can get massive. Uh, so you can end up with really bloated uh, perforce servers that have just got a load of ancillary content that it doesn't need. Uh, and you just don't need to be accessing this. So what you need to do is just set up a .p4 ignore. Uh, we'll go over this in a little bit more detail in a bit. Uh, and just mark saved and intermediate uh, to be ignored. And once you've got this set up correctly, if you try and push this content or mark it for add, uh, then it will come up with an error saying that it's, uh, it's part of the ignore file or uh, there's no content that can be added from here. Uh, and that's just a nice, easy way of doing it. So you can mark uh, folders uh, just by typing in the, the name uh, and then with a, uh, I think you need a, you might need a backslash, you might not. Uh, and then if you want to ignore particular file types as well, uh, you just put in um, st uh, star dot and then the particular file. So uh, I generally exclude um, anything that's not really a U asset. I tend not to put in there. So things like FBX files uh, or uh, .pngs or, um, you know, kind of any of these kind of core files because I want to keep those separately somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, especially with this, you know, kind of if it's a service that you're, you're paying for, you can keep all of this stuff. Um, you can, you know, if you do want to push FBX files and PNGs, you absolutely can. Um, but it's just, you know, it's just a way of excluding some content. So you can mark particular types, you can mark particular directories, and you can mark uh, specific subdirectories as well in there as well if you want to if you want to ignore that. So it's just a really useful way of kind of marking that content out. There were a few questions, sort of how if artists should be using version control for their assets, mm -hmm. and maybe in this regard, you know, you're iterating on the FPX, and eventually you're just pushing the final static mesh asset. However, if you are two artists both working on the FPX, then you want it to be able to be up um, on the server as well, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can do it's. Or would you prefer to export it out of the engine then mm. um, and iterate on it that way? I mean, it's it depends on how they're working on the asset, right? Because and and at what point do you decide mm -hmm. what gets pushed to the server and what doesn't? And that is completely up to up to you on on how valuable you think having multiple you know kind of stored versions mm -hmm. of those projects on the server is going to be. Uh, the problem with having that kind of content on there is that content can be huge, right? You imagine a PNG is probably fine, a PSD, right, which has got a thousand layers yeah. of various bits and is, you know, kind of 8K as big as it can go, right, is going to be a huge file that you're going to be pushing and pulling all mm -hmm. the time. Uh, and you might not want that content going onto your Perforce server. But it's, you know, it's your server at the end of the day. It's, it is kind of up to you. Uh, again, with, you know, kind of uh, with model files, right, do, do you put uh, the ZBrush sculpt data up there if you're, if you're doing sculpt work? Because again, those those files can get pretty hefty. Yeah. You know, here's my eight billion triangle uh -huh. uh, high poly mesh that I've been working on. Uh, let's you know, let's version control that. Um, I mean, I tend to have my uh, working files in something like Google Drive um, because it can store simple versions and backups of things if you if you overwrite mm -hmm. files, um, and I can offline stuff and and work on it online if I want to. Um, but yeah, it's it's up to you. You can. There's, I know lots of people who have an assets folder that kind of sits alongside their Unreal project, and that has all of their mesh files, all of their uh, all of their texture files that they're working on, and they can go through and they can they can check those out and edit them. Something that might be good to know, and I don't know when I discovered, but um, you you can add your own folders inside the project folder, and that won't screw with your project mm. in any way, right? Yeah. And so I tend to have a folder that's like builds, and that's actually where I. You know, I package and push all the builds to, mm -hmm. and if I need to share that, then I will push that build uh, to the Perforce if we're doing some like multiplayer testing. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, as long as it's as long as it's not going into the content not folder, into the content. it, won't, it yeah. won't it won't try and automatically read it and pull that pull that content in. Yeah, you can you can have other stuff that sits out here. You could make another depot that's just you know kind yeah. of. Um, that's uh, raw assets, and that or might be good like that, you know? um, in case someone's like, "Oh, I pushed three different test builds overnight," and <laughs> yeah, yeah. then you go pull and half half an hour to an hour later, you were able to work, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. So yeah, it's it's up to you. Like, there's there's ups and downs. Um, 
I, it, and a lot of it can be about cost as well, right? Like if you're a big company, yeah, um, and you've got you've got plenty of cash, and you, you know at that point you've probably got your own server set up anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, you're going to want to be pushing everything because you want it versioned. You want it. Yep. You want to be able to back History it up. History of everything. You want to make sure that you've got that content. Um, a lot of people uh, link up their. Uh, version submissions as a way of logging how they're working and the cost right. and the assets that they're doing and things like that because again perforce can tie into loads of different other um, other projects where you can link it with you know things like um, you know kind of uh, job uh, job lists and things that you need to get done so so yeah it's yeah it's it's uh it's kind of up to you on how you want to do it so uh okay Yes, so uh, we've got our we've got a we've got a depot. I've already made a few depots here. Um, you can have a blank one. These automatically get added. So if we're in P4 admin um, and we have uh, we make a new one, this will just appear in here. We might need to press the refresh button, but apart from that, it will it will just come up. Uh, what we need to do is we need to make a new workspace. By default, you won't have this. Uh, so I'm going to make a new one now. Uh, we'll probably stick with our original one just so we're not pulling content live. Uh, so uh, that's going to be in the wrong. I do that every time. Yeah. Uh, so we get this new window pop up. We name the workspace. Uh, so I'm just going to call it Epic Space Two. Uh, we mark the directory that we're putting it in. Um, it's generally good practice to put this stuff uh, as high up in the directory as you can. Yes. Um, just to keep the path name as short as possible. So, so most of the time you want to put it at the at the root drive. So inside C, or if you've got you know kind of just a you know like a working a working uh, hard drive that you want to keep it separate on, uh, you can do that. I'm going to be really lazy and just put it inside uh, the desktop, just so we've got it nice and uh, quick access. Uh, I've got to call this P42. And we're just going to select that. Then I'm going to click this little button here. This just converts it from this weird directory reading to a nice clean interface that's a bit easier to use. By default, it will just mark these as uh, depots that I can have access to. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to kind of uh, I'm just going to leave it as blank and just press OK. Then once we have that, we're going to get this empty workspace. Once we have that, we just need to start pu- uh, pushing content over from our depot to this workspace. So you can see I've got it selected here. We're at uh, Epic Space 2. I'm going to go to Racer, which is the current uh, little game that we've been working on. And I'm going to go down to Map to Workspace View. And you can see that's kind of come through in the directory again here. Once I press OK, it's going to come up with a do you want to uh, get that content now? Uh, we're going to pick Get Latest. and You can see it's kind of working away in the bottom right. One of the things with Perforce that I've noticed is it's not always great at telling you it's thinking and doing stuff. Yeah. Uh, So always check that bottom right little uh, loader bar um, because sometimes it can be a little bit rubbish at telling you that hey I'm working here Mm -hmm. I'm I am still pushing content or I am still pulling content so don't you know don't screw with anything uh, and you can see that once we pull this content we have none of that saved intermediate folder stuff that's the p4 ignore file doing its job um, some people like to put the p4 to mark the p4 to be ignored i always like having it pulled with it that way anyone who's pulling the content isn't going to accidentally push all of the saved directory stuff with them when they do it. It's so, a nice safety measure yeah, as the I, admin of the Yeah, I just, I just leave that folder, that, uh, that file in there. We can see all version control belong to us. I believe that was your contribution. That was my contribution. Uh, really. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's really <laughs> useful. Uh, so you can see that that pulled pretty quickly. We have a pretty good internet connection here. So, uh, so yeah. Uh, so once we've got that, we, are, uh, we have now got our content directory. If you have... Uh, if it's your first time making um, a depot, the depot will be empty, uh, at which point you still need to map it, but then you need to add some content to it. I always add just a little text file, mm-hmm. right? So I'll just make a text file, put a little, you know, kind of a little bit of random text into it, save it out so that the file's not nothing, uh, just as a... I think it's more just me than anything else. I think it'll probably work fine as an. It's also good one. to test, right? If it's yeah, the first yeah. time you're setting it up, just pushing something up simple. Yeah, just make sure that it's all working. Um, what you can do once you've made that, it will appear inside here. We right click uh, and we just do mark for add. So I can't do this with this because this is a uh, this is a new one. Let's let's just do that now. 
So I'm going to go to racer because that's the directory that this depot is working in. Uh, if we pulled this one, we would get a folder called third person that sits next to racer. So that's how your content is still uh, separated out. So I'm just going to go in uh, and add, this is it, that's the one. I'm just going to add a new text document just so you can see. Uh, refresh this, you can see the new text document gets put there. Pardon me. And then press mark for add. Once we do that, we'll get a little pending change list. Uh, so I'm just going to pop that as OK. And then we can submit. And that's basically going to push this new asset to our server. So I'm just going to do that now because we might as well. Uh, we need to write a change list. Uh, the change lists are super, super important. Do not um, be lazy with your change list description. This is how people know what you have done with that particular pull. So it's really useful for being able to search through and find where particular, uh, particular parts of the engine have been added or particular parts of the game have been put in or modified. So make sure that uh, when you're working, keep track of everything that you're checking out and what you're doing to it so you can add it to that change list later because you are going to want to make sure that you're, you're keeping on top of that. Uh, pushed. Yeah, chat uh, saying always, always write <laughs> commit messages. <laughs> yeah. Because you never know what kind of problems you might come no, into. No, I know, yeah. And it's... we haven't touched on that yet, but mm -hmm. you know, storing it and having a backup of your of your work is one thing, but one the power of version control is that in case something happens, yeah. you don't have to lose weeks since the last time mm -hmm. someone put it on a hard drive and yeah. that's what you need to bring back. Even if you're working um, just with yourself, yeah. right? Like um, one of the really useful things for students with uh, version control is that it deals with all of your uh, or a lot of your documentation that you have to do, right? A lot of the time, if you're a student, you're working on a, on an art project. You have to demonstrate the development of the art project that you're working on. If you're using version control, you can just look back in your history and you can actually revert back to that particular yeah. thing without destroying any of the other content grab a few screenshots because you forgot to do that area uh -huh. and then go back in. And then you look really organized, uh, even if you're not. Uh, so I'm just going to put push demo text file, submit. And then that has been pushed through. If we go back over to our depot uh, section, you can see that new text document has been added uh, to the server. So that's now held on the server as well. So if Victor was to go on to, uh, onto Perforce, he'd be able to see that that new text document had been added. And if he pressed the Get Latest button, he'd then be able to pull uh, that text file, add to it, do whatever he wanted to. Are you, add are you adding to it? OK. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then he'd be able to send that back up. Send that back up. I'm working on it. I have to write a <laughs> uh, commit message. <laughs> Got to add that commit message. Uh, and then once it gets pulled, I can pull it, and now I can see the change that's been made. Uh, on my workspace. So very useful stuff there. You done it? You there done we it? go. You yeah. Done it? You done it? Okay. Oh, yeah, there we go. So we've got a little, we've got a little triangle uh, that's appeared over there. Uh, you can see get latest has now uh, not grayed out anymore. Uh, so we can get that. And if I open up this text document, <laughs> oops, I did it again. Uh, that's been added to it. And I can see that uh, you know, kind of if, I'd op if I open up the history uh, of oh, that. Uh, I showed him how to open the um, history window. It's which it's not on by default, and no, I wish, where, I wish it was. Uh, view, it's view, isn't view it? and then history. Yeah, thank you. I, that's one of the first things I usually it's, do when open yeah, up the client. The history, the history tab is super useful because you can just see through, and you can see the descriptions here listed. So uh, change the demo text file for Aaron's <laughs> amusement. Yes, excellent. Uh, so again, it's just, you can do this for individual files. So being able to see what you're doing you know, kind of, uh, for each individual asset is, uh, is very useful. Uh, so uh, at this point, we've got the workspace set up. All that we need to do now is uh, actually um, push, uh, link up our Unreal project with Perforce, because by default, it's going to be off. Right? So this is our source control button. It's nice and big. Uh, by default, it's going to have a little red, um, mm -hmm. red circle with a cross through it so you, you, to mark that it's not there. Uh, I'm just going to go to change source control settings. Uh, so what we have is we have a provider. Uh, this, these are the different options. As you can see, we've got the plastic SCM that's been uh, recently added. Uh, so you pick the version that you want to use. Uh, so if we look at subversion, you can see we've got um, 
basically the repo name. So again, that's just the IP address uh, with the uh, uh, with the port number and the directory name, the username that you're using, and then the password to access it uh, if you're using that. Uh, so we don't want to do that, obviously. We want to be using Perforce for this one. Uh, you can see we've got our lovely IP address listed there. We've got my username, which I'm using, uh, and then we've got the workspace that we're doing. If we open this up, uh, and if it's working, it should yeah. automatically pick it up. If not, you can manually type this in. And then if you press Accept Settings, it should figure it out yep. and, and, and go through and realize it. If not, you've done something wrong. Uh, and then we've got this tab here. Uh, and you, this is, I'm not going to open this, uh, but this is where you can put in your password. So uh, this means that you won't have to open Perforce, um, the P4V project, when you want to work in Engine. Because you don't need to have Perforce open um, at this point. Uh, you just need to make sure that you're logged in under these source control settings. Uh, press accept. It'll say connection to source control successful. And then uh, you probably won't see any particular change straight away. Um, but this is now set up with, uh, with, with Perforce. So uh, if I get, let's, uh, let's do a quick demo. Um, Victor, could you check out just any file? Just, just pick one for me and, uh, and, and check one out. And we'll just have a, a quickly go over what those individual things look like and, and being able to identify that. So I checked out the uh, Landscape Master. Landscape Master, OK. Master. Master. So if we go to Landscape, we can see Landscape Master. You should be able to see here. I'm just going to increase the size of this so that you can see it. We've got this little blue uh, check with a little padlock next to it. If we hover over it, you can see uh, checked out by Victor. So this is telling us that we can't work on this file. So if I try and do this now, oh, just give it a sec. What's it doing? There we go. Source control. So you can see we've got the little source control tab uh, right at the bottom. Uh, we can kind of refresh this. But if I try and work on it now, so I'm just going to disconnect this thing and save. I could have picked the smaller material or it's simpler fine. asset, but it's fine. Let's see what it does. We should get some conflict. Uh, come up saying mm -hmm. that uh, the asset's checked out so that we can't do anything with it. Um, and at that point, you'll get the option, if this doesn't want to run, uh, to make it writable, right? So at that point, you're basically forcing your ability to save it. Um, but that asset Locally. has not been checked out, right? So here we go. Okay, don't know why that took a while. but uh, So we can't uh, check this stuff out. You can see if I click on the particular thing that I want to do, it says who it's checked out by. And the checkout selected is grayed out, mm -hmm. right? So I can't push this content back up to the server. I can make it writable, which means that I can work on it locally, um, but that's not going to be able to get pushed back, right? Because I'll need to then pull back your content uh, once you, you you release it, uh, and then I can push mine. But at that point, you know, we'll get some we'll get some issues. Uh, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna. Uh, uh, ask me later. Okay. I can I can revert it. I'm just going to cancel that. Yeah. Nope. Don't want to save. Uh, so yeah, we can have a look and and see the I content's reverted now it. reverted. Yeah. Uh, so now I can go in and I can uh, I can start editing this stuff and, and modifying it. Uh, again, should, probably shouldn't have done this with the mouse. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah. There's not that much to it. It should be okay. It's having a bit of a grumble. It's making real sure that. Uh, yeah, it's really double checking. Yeah. Uh, that we've got the that we've got the correct permissions to access this stuff. Uh, so yeah. See, we're definitely getting a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, some of them are really good, so um, we can we can go through those while this loading bar is going from zero to. All right. So 100. we're we're pretty much. Um, so how do we version control blueprints? And by version control, I mean diff and other things like peer review, since they are binary files, and that makes us cry. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so we're going to go over some some methods of breaking up your blueprints, but yeah, the this is the kind of the key problem with working with binary files, mm -hmm. right? Is that you can only have one at a time, uh, one person having it checked out at a time. You can't merge them back together if you've kind of got multiple different versions. Not automatically. Not automatically, yeah. no. And, and we've got uh, we have this big problem with blueprints, right? Where it is 
code that we're working on, but you can't you can't diff those things. Or well, you can diff them, but you can diff them. You can't yeah. mer you can't merge them. Um, so generally, what uh, what we what we say for uh, for uh, checking quality is uh, you we have a thing called shelving inside uh, inside Perforce inside Subversion as well. So you mm -hmm. can do, you can do the same in that. Um, so if we open up uh, our repo, you can press uh, I think it's Control G. Yeah. yeah? Uh, so this allows you to um, to shelve. Oh no, sorry. Uh, this allows you to find find a shelved file, right? Uh, so, so what we can do is we can shelve anything that we want while we're working on it. And what this will do is it will allow other people to access it. So it does get stored uh, uh, inside the server, but it doesn't replace or update the files for everyone. So if you're working on a blueprint um, and you want to, you know, kind of, uh, you want to send it to your boss first, or you want it to send it to a to a friend to check over, but you don't want it going uh, into the main project for everyone to be able to pull. Uh, you can shelve that, uh, and then once you've shelved it, you press Control G, and this will give you a change list number, which you can then send. Uh, sorry, uh, the person who needs to check it can enter that in. That will give pull them it. access to that shelf. Uh, and then they can then pull it and check it. Uh, so that's kind of the way that you can kind of have uh, your assets checked over without having it pushed straight into the source. Which again, if you're if you're working on like a game mode or something, and you're like, hmm, if I've screwed this up in some way, uh, and I push this, I'm breaking the entire game for everyone. So let's not do that. Uh, so you can you can kind of shelve that content first and, and then send it over. Uh, again, uh, one of the things as well is Perforce has a, a pretty uh, comprehensive um, docs uh, page as well. So if you are looking for particular ways on uh, setting this stuff up, you can you can look at it on there. Um, yeah, that looks like it's gone through. Okay, so now we have our project. It's stored uh, on the server, uh, assuming that we've pushed that content over to it. Uh, and we've got our local repository, and now we've got our little game here. So this is the advanced vehicle blueprint, but I've added uh, just a few little extra bits so that we can talk about how you can break up your project. So we've got these little little things here that will run away from you. Uh, if you drive too close to them, you can run them over and squash them. Um, and yeah, it's, it's they're fine. They get back up. They don't die or anything. <laughs> There's no violence. No, there's no violence. Just, just, just chasing, chasing them down and running them over, and then letting them pop back up again. Uh, so <laughs> that one tried to attack me. Then. <laughs> I haven't programmed you to do that. Um, so yeah, what I want to do now is just go over various ways that you can break up your project uh, to make it uh, less likely that you'll run into checkout issues. So regardless of what we do today, um, you are always unless you're working by yourself, going to run into uh, problems with checkout contention and, and just, uh, in fact, in fact, even if you're working on your own, you'll run into issues. Because uh, when I was uh, doing my own projects, uh, I would often check something out on a PC and then I wouldn't be able to access it on my on laptop the, uh, because uh -huh. I checked it out. <laughs> uh, so you can even run into checkout issues with, your, <laughs> with yourself. Um, so this will always happen, um, but there's several things inside Unreal that will let you break up your projects into just smaller chunks. And that way, uh, you'll be able to have multiple people working on multiple elements of, uh, of the same. And there are the other, same other reasons why that's a good thing. It's not only for collaboration or yeah. the possibility yeah, to work. Absolutely. It, even doing it yourself you know, can safeguard you for the future if yeah. you want to reuse assets. Mm -hmm. um, there are many reasons why. Yeah, I mean, uh, one particular one is at the uh, behavior tree mm -hmm. um, level, right? So uh, what you can do is you can swap in and out behavior trees as you go. So instead of having one massive behavior tree that's doing all these checks, uh, so I can let's open up base just so we can see. So if you don't know how behavior trees uh, behavior trees work. They operate right going down the tree from left to right. Uh, so whenever we uh, go through this, the, we have a condition here that sets to squashed. Just because squashed isn't true doesn't mean that we're not always checking to see if squashed is true. 
right? So uh, with this particular condition, we're checking to see if, uh, if we've been squashed, right? And uh, we have an abort, observer abort on both. And what this will do is when this value changes, it will abort, abort itself. Uh, and when these, uh, it detects a value change on this, it will abort these as well. And that way I can have this logic be overridden by this logic if I want to. Uh, but every time I run through this, uh, my default state, which is going to just be kind of wait a bit, wander around, wait a bit, wander around, right? All this logic is still being checked, right? Because it needs to check whether I'm being mm -hmm. aborted out. Uh, and this is a very simple behavior tree, uh, but you could potentially get really complex behaviors. And at that point, you could have lots and lots and lots of things checking to see if they're true or if an enum's been changed or if a particular act has been set mm -hmm. and, and all of these things. Uh, so you might want to split off your behavior tree into different logic where you know I'm in this particular type of behavior, so I only want to run this particular logic, right? Uh, I'm sure we could talk about this another time. I think Wes I think did a really good talk on this. He did. This. Yeah, yeah uh, he did a great live stream on yeah. behavior trees, but it seems like maybe you'll have to come back and do that as well. Well, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so this uh, content is really good to be able to break up. Uh, same with materials as well. Material functions um, don't, as far as I'm aware, don't actually cost uh, any more than having the same logic that is just running on a massive, massive web. So this is our landscape material here. Uh, and we've got kind of the rock material function and a dirt material function. Uh, and basically, it's just allowing us to paint this dirt path. So if I just go in, uh, I'm going to need to check out as well, I think. Uh, this is the other thing that you should do. Um, try not to change the content um, and then check it out. Check out first and then change the content. Uh, it, it's quite a difficult um, mindset to get into because for a while you're probably thinking, I just work on the particular thing that I need. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we just refresh it, then check it out. And that way, um, we know that we're not going to waste any time. Right? If I start fiddling with this terrain and then I go to save it, that's the point where it's going to be like, you can't save it because Victor's got it checked out. So we need to be able to check that first before you start wasting a load of time, you know, kind of uh, adding content in. So I've got this uh, this little this little dirt path, and I can kind of paint it in and paint it out. Uh, so we've got some, you know, kind of little bits like that, right? So we can kind of just go in like this, and I've got a little bit of extra texture detail in there that's allowing us to to control that stuff. So if we go back into our uh, landscape, master landscape, there we go. All of the the logic that's happening inside here, uh, even though there's not much, it's quite it's quite simple. And inside here, um, this is kind of exactly the same as if we were to have copied and pasted that, and then done that you know that traditional landscape layer blend, and then we add the particular things that we need. It's just cleaner, right? So that's the other benefit as well, especially mm -hmm. when we, when you're working with materials. I see a lot of people when they're building uh, mainly landscape materials, they they use this method of doing it. So they have their landscape layer blend, and then they have like five different versions of it for the base color, for the roughness, for the metal, for the normal, for the height, or for, you know, for whatever. Um, and really, you know, kind of the, the blend function, uh, the material functions are so much better for that because one, they allow you to separate out each of those material types. And two, they allow you to just make it so much cleaner. So you can imagine that instead of having all of this mess, uh, we would be able to kind of break it up nice and easily. Uh, so yeah. So I think that covers the uh, that. A few more bit, things. Yeah, uh, yeah we can a, mention. We've got a few more. Um, actor components is another good way to encapsulate logic mm -hmm. uh, within an object that you can check out and work on separately. Yeah. Um, I think the first time I ever saw that in really large scale was in uh, Conan Exiles. Mm -hmm. And their player pawn was almost entirely consisted of um, Actor components, right? And that was so that you know they had each part of whether it was logic back and forth to the server. Um, a lot of it is save data, sort of what gear you have. Mm -hmm. uh, they were all encapsulated into their own actor components, yeah. which allows a developer to work on you know um, 
stats, another one to work on gear, another mm -hmm. one to work on the save system. Yeah, um, it's the same. So we've got uh, Blueprint function libraries and Blueprint macro libraries. Um, they're kind of they have a multi-purpose use, so they're really useful for sharing logic across mm -hmm. multiple blueprints. So if you, you you shouldn't have to remake the same macro or the same blueprint functionality uh, for each individual uh, blueprint asset you're working on. You can use these uh, in order to kind of share that logic across, but you can also use it. Uh, to reduce your checkout contention. Yeah. Because if I need to work on something, but the thing that I need to work on is just a function that I can access through here, I can open it up in the function library uh, and then work on that. And then the actual core stuff that's using it can still be checked out by other people and worked on and, and all of that, uh, that good stuff. Uh, same with Blueprint interfaces. Uh, same with the game playability system, actually. That's, mm -hmm. that's another really good one that just lets you break up that content uh, a little bit more so that you can work on particular effects or uh, particular actions uh, as its own standalone thing which can be checked out rather than having one massive blueprint that is you know kind of got control over all these particular uh, particular things um, we've got a few others as well so inside let's go to vehicle uh, inside our anim component as well. We also have sub animations as well. So this has been in the engine for a while. It's a little bit different from the uh, the uh, animation linking, blue, uh, animation and blueprint linking, which has been added in 424, I think it is. Um, so this is our kind of base uh, vehicle blueprint. Uh, you can see it's got a lot, a lot of components, which is kind of making up the logic for, you know, kind of uh, all of the hinge components and uh, and spring components, but I've added this uh, extra uh, blueprint sub uh, sub blueprint called overcompensate. And what this will do is it will just increase the size of the antenna uh, on the on the vehicle itself, so we can increase that, whack it up, get a nice and uh, nice big antenna if we want to, or if you know we're not we're not bothered about that kind of thing, we can set it down to something a bit smaller. And this is its own independent anim graph uh, where. Again, I'm just doing a very simple transform uh, of the of the root of the antenna here, um, but you can do a lot more inside that. And again, this allows you to have multiple people working on different elements of the anim graph without uh, without having any issues of uh, checkout contention. Because the person who's working on this core one, uh, he's not having to worry about, or they're not having to worry about. Uh, you know, kind of anything that's going on in here, it's just got the link. So they can carry on working on any of these assets. And then whoever's working on the sub uh, anim element can carry on working on the sub anim, and, and that's absolutely fine. No problems there. Uh, same with that. So uh, behavior trees, uh, we've done a little bit of before. They're great uh, because the they focus very much on little bits of bite-sized logic, right? So we have uh, tasks, decorators, and services, and then we have the trees themselves. The trees can be broken up um, either by uh, you calling them inside another tree. So, so this one has a little bit of logic here, so it checks if it's squashed, as we said before, uh, but it also checks if it needs to run away uh, from the car or try to. Uh, and if that becomes true, then we run this behavior. So this is just another uh, another option, right? We can run behavior. This allows us to pick a whole other tree uh, that we can access, and then that is a completely different tree that we can go in and we can edit and we can work on. I didn't actually know that. Awesome. Good. <laughs> well, I've taught one person something, so yeah, I'm going to take that as a win. Presentation uh, success. <laughs> <laughs> so we have the uh, you know kind of this bit of logic here that can run. The great thing about having this inside here as well is that all of these decorators are still running and still checking. So even though I'm technically working in a different behavior tree, this check to see if uh, the little critter's been squashed is still being ran. So it's still going, am I being squashed? So it still has um, priority mm -hmm. over this secondary behavior tree. And then we can also run the behavior tree uh, independently as well. So there's nothing that stops us from saying, actually, little critter, just do this. So it will just always try and run away, always be running away from it. And it has no other logic uh, outside of that. Uh, yeah, uh, behavior trees are, are really cool. They, they take a little bit of getting right. your head round, um, but 
yeah, they're really good. But all of these things, if I just, uh, uh, let's just double click on that. Um, all of these things here, so the uh, decorators, the services, and the tasks are all individual blueprint elements, mm -hmm. right? So this is the service. Uh, that's basically just doing a distance check from the player, right? So when it gets activated, it gets player control to zero and gets the pawn. Um, you know, kind of not great reusability-wise. You, you might run into some issues with this, but you know, kind of whatever. Uh, the kind of the base get the character, get the main player, and then on the tick, uh, which is a controlled tick, uh, so it's not running, you know, kind of every single frame. Uh, it's running at a controlled rate. Uh, so every single time this is called, we get the distance from the pawn to the to the player, uh, and then we'll just compare that against the minimum value that we're setting. If that value is exceeded, we set our, our little critter to run, and then it starts legging it. So yeah, nice, easy logic. Uh, that service is getting called in here, so when this gets activated, uh, that's running. At the moment, it runs every 0.5 seconds with a random deviation of 0.1. Uh, so it's it's much more optimized than actually running on the event tick. Uh, but this is a nice individual bit of code. So I can be working on this behavior tree. You could be working on that service. Mm -hmm. And we would have no issues whatsoever because the two things are uh, are independent. They, you know, they're just they're just referencing uh, referencing one another. Um, finally, I think we might have some more. Uh, we also have levels as well. Uh, so this uh, level is broken up into just a few different chunks that I've uh, I've done. You can do a lot more, um, and depending on how you want to work, you can you can break up your level. Uh, but we can have persistently loaded uh, sub levels inside our asset. So this is marked always loaded, so it's always in there. Um, all I've done is I've separated out the track uh, from the main. Uh, main level. This means that you uh, can go in and you can open up, uh, if we go to, I think it's here, uh, you can go to track. Uh, it's probably not going to be lit, so we'll just go to unlit for now. You can go to that track and you can work on this and check it out and do whatever you want, and I can be happily inside the master uh, for this, getting on with whatever particular area I need to be getting on with. Uh, generally, um, we split by uh, kind of disciplines, yeah. right? So uh, game logic, um, lighting, even particle effects, and, audio. you know, kind of effects. Audio, yeah, that's a great one. Um, you'll, you'll split up those so that people who have different disciplines, different skill sets, aren't interfering with one another. Um, we also have world composition, uh, which I haven't got a setup on here for uh, uh, today, but again, it's... It, that's automatically kind of chunking up your world into different uh, sections of the world. So you can work on individual kind of areas and components of that without getting in the way of one another. Uh, and then finally, on the levels thing, we uh, also have, even though it's kind of originally intended as an enterprise thing, uh, we have the uh, server-based uh, editor. So this is really cool because it allows you to uh, have one version of the editor, which can still have version control, uh, can still do all of that stuff, but multiple people can access it, and then they can collaboratively work on the same level in at, real time. at the same at the yeah. same time. We yeah. did a stream on that. Like, yeah, you go there's, back yeah the, there's a stream uh, on it. Check the stream. It's cool. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, you also had a stream uh, with Ryan Brooks on it recently, mm -hmm. uh, where he talked about some of the plans uh, that we've got for how we want to develop open world and levels generally. Um, what this will do, again, go back and have a look at that stream, because it's just every time he does stuff, it's just like... Yeah, it's <laughs> um, wizard. Yeah. Uh, but he kind of talks about how we're changing world composition uh, to be a lot more freeform and to allow a lot more people to work on assets together, um, you know, kind of with, with greater ease. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to think if we've got anything else. I think those are the kind of the key components of... Uh, of different ways that you can that you can break up your project. Um, obviously, the the main thing is um, is just you know kind of is communication yeah. with your team uh, and and just you know kind of keeping on top of it, just being careful about how you're doing it. Um, one of the big things with Unreal is it, it will try and check out files 
uh, or mark files as dirty that need to be saved and then checked out when it doesn't need to. Mm -hmm. So if you find that you've got a level open for quite a long period of time, um, it will kind of think, even though you haven't done anything to it, this needs to be saved. And at that point, it will be like, you need to check this out, even though you haven't done anything to it. Um, so make sure that you aren't doing, aren't just checking it out just to kind of keep it happy. Uh, just revert it or ignore it or, you know, kind of just... Um, un just uncheck it, it is usually what I do. And then the next time it yeah. comes up, you, you just need to click save for whatever you want. And yeah, anything yeah. that was unchecked will not get saved and it won't try to check it out for mm -hmm. you. Yeah. And then on the um, uh, the the kind of the co the checkout contention and merging, we are looking at trying to get more assets where it makes sense to be able to actually diff between those mm -hmm. those things. At the moment, we're we're still a way off uh, having anything like that implemented, but. You know, it's something that we're you know kind of we're, we're looking to do and we're hoping that we can get. So I guess we could access. show uh, just quickly the blueprint dev tool. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's let's just think which is going to be good. I'm not sure if we've got enough uh, things to diff against, but we'll try. This should have it. Okay. Cool. So so one of the things you can do, even though you can't um, you can't actually merge these, you can look at the changes that you're creating. Um, one thing that you can also do, actually, I, I forgot to mention this, uh, is you know you can copy and paste all Blueprint to text files, right? You you can technically merge those. Technically, um, it's more of a gimmicky thing than it is actually anything useful, but because uh, it will detect literally anything like a node movement change and things like that. Uh, so this is our this is our diff tool. Um, it doesn't have much to it because we haven't got any differences really select <laughs> any any detected because uh, I built this all in pretty much one go, mm -hmm. so we haven't got a lot to show. Um, but you can see uh, the event system. Uh, you can also see the actual graph as well. Uh, so you can kind of go through and you can visually look at the differences between the two assets. Um, so yeah, it's it's a it's useful tool for being able to decide it. Hopefully you you will work in a way where you won't need to use it. And this is actually when um, I've previously been doing um, Blueprint reviews. Mm -hmm. We would use the div tool. So we would do what we oh, talked cool. about earlier. Yeah, yeah. Um, say, you'll shell the asset. Mm -hmm. um, I'll do Control g in per P4V. Mm -hmm. um, you'll tell me what the CL is, because you clearly need to tell me that I need to review it. Yeah. Um, I'll download that, and then I'll open up the Blueprint div tool. Mm -hmm. Because even though you tell me, oh, hey, I, I only changed uh, you know, the, the max throttle of the vehicle. Sure. Can I be sure that that's all you did? <laughs> you know, maybe you fat fingered something or, yeah, or touched yeah. something, and the Blueprint Div tool will tell you every single thing that has been changed. And <laughs> so, for me as the person who is the gatekeeper, making sure that everything is working and you know it's implemented the way we want it to, um, I can then get a much better idea of what actually happened. Even though I trust you, I mean, I'm sure you just worked you, on the throttle. I, I definitely just worked on the throttle. Yeah, that's it. I might it. have worked on the other thing. And then the well, antenna is like three times yeah, the size, yeah. and yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. One thing that might be worth doing is, do you want to do a, a quick change? Sure, I can do that. Just to just to show it, like if you change the um, like the dirt material mm -hmm. on the landscape, it's a nice visual change, just so you can we can see it, uh, we can see it coming. Uh, so I might at the moment I've got the landscape master checked out, um, but that shouldn't matter uh, for Victor, right? Because he's going to be working inside the actual function itself rather than the master. Um, so he'll be working in this file here. Uh, and being able to change the color of the landscape, maybe the gradient that it's working across. We'll see how fancy he gets. We'll probably, we'll probably keep it pretty basic. M make it something, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, this way we can see that I, so I've got this master file checked out at the moment. I, I'm going to just refresh this to see if he's, ch he's remembered to check it out, and he has. So he's got this file checked out. I can carry on working on you know, kind of other elements of this material if I wanted to. So while he's working on this, uh, I could check out uh, the rock uh, version. So I'm just going to go over here, uh, press the checkout, and then I'm going to open this up. And I'm just going to change uh, the color. What color are you going for? I don't want anything too conflicting. Um, well, why don't we just make just, it I'm up? just going to go bright pink. Yeah. Have you gone bright pink or are you okay? No, I did not go okay, bright pink. Good. I checked uh, it in. <laughs> So I can apply this change. Uh, we'll just have to wait, let the, uh, the old shader compile. Uh, and this doesn't need to be done for landscapes. Um, you can do this for, you know, kind of 
any materials that you're working on. Uh, we've got a new uh, layered material system as mm -hmm. well, um, which this will work great for, because again, you can have your layered material setup, which is just referencing uh, all of these different material functions, uh, each of which can be edited and checked out on their own, uh, whereas the actual master material for the asset can be, can be worked out on individually. Uh, what we can also do as well is we could make an instance of this, and that way we could edit base things on the instance mm -hmm. to just tweak and, and check. Uh, but the actual master itself, uh, you could leave for other people to be able to work on if they needed to actually develop the, uh, the material itself. If you're iterating there and sort of you're trying stuff and I'm trying stuff, exposing as much as possible using uh, parameters in the master mm -hmm. and then having one instance each that we can iterate yeah. on and compare. Yeah, if you don't care what the um, what the value needs to be, fix mm -hmm. that. Then, yeah, absolutely, expose that stuff out to the to the to the function, uh, and that's all good. Uh, so I'm just gonna let's just so we can do like just a general sync. Um, so we can do that just by clicking this uh, on the content, and that will just check everything and just and just start pulling as much stuff as this possible. Uh, this is kind of going. You've modified this package, but you haven't checked it out. Do you want to reload it? So I'm, I I don't care. So that's fine. Don't care on that one. 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 God, I had a lot of stuff edited that one <laughs> checked out. It's been bad. Uh, oh, you have to do it at least once on the stream. I, I guess so. Yeah, yeah is it Woo! part of it? <laughs> Little crash. I almost wonder wonder what we did there. I think it's probably because I had too much stuff that I was fiddling with when I shouldn't have been. I don't think I've ever seen a crash from <laughs> sub trying to submit yeah, before. You haven't, you haven't seen me working. Oh, uh, so that's why. So what about that project? <laughs> 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 Tell me that's how it's going to be like. Uh, you were working on dirt, right? Yeah. OK, cool. Uh, so I just need to reconnect source control because it looks like it's lost the connection. Uh, so by default, it, you can set it so that your um, your the perforce text is actually hard link to go to the particular IP. Uh, we know this off by heart, don't we? 1.8.62.22.200. You got it. Yes. Uh, we're looking at epic space. And we still have a little bit of time for questions before, okay, cool. um, before we don't the stream, if you're wondering. Right, we'll go to epic space 2. Oh, I don't know if it's going to like that. Uh, it, yeah, it might be because we were kind of messing around with it. So you can see we've got this little uh, exclamation mark that's appeared next to uh, MF dirt. That's kind of indicating that we need to do a sync and we need to do a pull. So let's try and do that now and just see what happens. So it looks like you've changed the color to a hideous code of green. Well, it's <laughs> grass rather than... <laughs> <laughs> I've never <laughs> seen I've never seen grass that toxic. <laughs> it's a full one. It is a full one. Yeah. Jeez. Uh, you so didn't tell me to make it look pretty. Uh, you're right. I didn't. That's yeah. on. That's on me. Okay. So we'll let the shaders compile and hopefully this will. Uh, this will yeah, I'm not sure what happened with Incredibuild here. Um, it was working yeah. four two three. I, I think I just need to set it up again. Yeah. This is the other cool thing. I didn't realize this that you were telling me about. Is the uh, exposing the FPS count just mm -hmm. in the top corner? It's a really nice little extra feature, so you don't have to stat it. Yeah, I don't have to clobber the three D uh, viewport with yeah, yeah. the right. stat FPS counter. Let me just check my landscape master to see if there's anything going on here, because we should be seeing it in green. It's very green on my end. Yeah, just going to refresh the. Looks like you've got the landscape master checked out. No, that's well. you. You got to check that. Oh, is me? Yep. Then why is it? Let's just refresh. And oh, it's not liking this. You want to show them uh, how to revert it? No, I know what's going on. With the problem, so this is the problem with setting up the same perforce twice. <laughs> I've got it checked out on P4, uh, on on Epic Space One, and I'm working in Epic Space Two at the moment. Okay. So anyway. So no changes to so the landscape won't... master is. So I, yeah, so I'm not going to be able to change any of this stuff. Uh, we should still be seeing this material there change. There we go. Uh, so yeah, it is. The change has come across. It just doesn't seem to be propagating. I think it's because we've got the actual, uh, the landscape master checked out, so it's not able to update mm -hmm. uh, on this uh, on this sub file. But anyway, um, 
One other thing I'll, I'll just show uh, super quick as well is just uh, what it looks like when we make a new thing. Uh, so we've got this little question mark that uh, appears here. This is just saying, uh, what do we want to do with this file that mm -hmm. we've made? It knows that it's not in the in the in the depot yet. So uh, what we need to do is just uh, press the mark for add. You don't need to do this once you've uh, saved it out. As soon as you press the submit to source control, it should find that particular thing. So you can see this new particle systems listed here. Uh, so anything that's got a plus, we don't need to mark every single thing for add. So don't worry about having to do that if you've got lots of different files. You can just kind of make you know uh, as many as you like and then and then mass add it. So so we can do that. Uh, and then we can also you know kind of delete it or or remove it or whatever we want to do. Uh, so just take that out. It's quite comprehensive, and I don't think we're going to. Source control can be um, something that slows you down occasionally, right? Mm. So we just had this issue here. Now, yeah. although we aren't maybe doing it the most proper way because it's just a demonstration, but mm -hmm. um, but it's important to realize that the amount of work you can lose and the amount of work, um, time that you yeah. can save um, because of the fact that you have it is always worth it. Even if you're one, even if I work on my own project, I always keep it on source control, mm -hmm. whether that's a simple SVN setup or if it's a proper server somewhere, yeah. because you never know when something's going to go wrong. You And also more so, it's sort of like, oh, I worked late no one night, mm -hmm. and then I was pushing a bunch of stuff, making some major changes, and the next morning, I'm like, wait, what did I actually do yesterday? Yeah. You go back, and if you've been detailing your commit messages, um, then you can just Go back and see what you did. Yeah, that I mean, it adds an extra step, mm -hmm. right? So yes, it's going to add a little bit of extra, you know, time consumption. You might have to s spend a little bit of time just fixing stuff up, yeah. which you wouldn't have otherwise had to do. But the gains that you get just are so far and away just blown out the water. When so, when I was a a, a younger person, I did a a game uh, and it was done without any source control. And I would work on memory sticks, just kind of transferring uh -huh. it across from computer to computer as I needed. Um, and then once I finished the game and, and, and kind of released it, I went back and I kind of started working in version control. And then to go back to that project, I was just like, how did I work like this with the kind of the paralysis of knowing that if I screw up, <laughs> I have no, I've got like one step back of, yeah. revert, uh, of revert that I can do. Uh, I think that's something else as well. We, every single asset has a history as well. So this is the other really useful thing, right? Mm -hmm. Is that we can right click and we can see the history location. We can just go back to any point uh, in the pushed life cycle of this particular thing. Soz if I break it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, it's 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 just absolutely vital. I mean, it's you know, every single person in the games industry is using version control, yep. right? Like it's there's. There's so few reasons to not do it that you know you, you just should. Might be a little bit of a learning period, as most yeah, things are. Yeah, there'll be a little thing. Yeah. Um, but actually, you know, kind of, it's the on the front end. Uh, there's not that much to it. Like all you're doing is um, is just you. All you need to do is add the extra step of checking something out, pushing something back in, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then. And then that's all you're going to be doing for like 90% of the time. There's going to be some very small issues where uh, you might have to resolve some conflicts or fix up, you know, kind of some issues where something's gone wrong somewhere. Um, but most of the time, it's just going to be an absolute, you know, godsend that you've you've got this this backup uh, that's nice and nice and safe. Yeah. <laughs> for um, as long as DigitalOcean is up and running. <laughs> <laughs> which which. From my experience, it, it's yeah. been very reliable. Yeah, yeah, I haven't had any issues with it. I've had a had a local uh, uh, Perforce server set up on there for like yeah. five years. Have now. you said I've also used Amazon? Um, yeah, EC2 servers on AWS. They, a, they work. That's a really good. They point. have a really nice yeah. um, console interface. I even think there's a tutorial on YouTube. Mm -hmm. That's like a 15 minute thing on how to set that up. Yeah. Uh, they have a free tier if you're actually interested in uh, trying that out. Yeah, you can. Uh, yeah, you can mix and match. Right. All of this stuff that we've talked about as well, like uh, there's no reason why you can't buy a server. You know, they're what like 800 quid, maybe a grand for like just a very small, you know, kind of personal one. Mm -hmm. uh, you could buy a personal uh, Windows-based server. I think is better for Perforce. I, maybe that's for Jenkins. Uh, but you buy, you know, buy a server, um, set it up at home, do the exact same setup, mm -hmm. um, but just doing it to that particular IP address. Then you've got your own little personal Perforce yep. server set up. Um, you know, kind of, 
there's there's no reason why you have to use DigitalOcean. There's as you said, there's loads of different uh, loads of different um, kind of providers that yeah. can that can do Cloud that stuff providers. for you. So yeah, I mean there's there's a real range of uh, range of options. I know we haven't talked about Git much on this, but Git is again you know kind of a it's a it's another option, especially if you're not um, really caring about front end artistic or mm -hmm. uh, or maybe even some of the design elements where you're working inside the editor. You know, if you're working in the engine most of the time, you're going to want to be in in Git because it's it's just got and more it can be traditional for teams um, to have the programmers who are sort of iterating on engine uh, rather than the project files mm -hmm. that they actually keep that on a Git repo. Yeah. Since it's easier to sync and cherry pick and, and pull uh, from the official ones that are available on GitHub. Yeah, you can mi you can mix and match uh, your your version controls uh, setup if if you want to, um, and and that's absolutely fine. Uh, so we've got some. Uh, so just uh, very quickly as well. Um, so I think we might have missed just one or two bits. So with uh, setting up your P4 ignore, you will need to do a tiny bit of code. Uh, so if you open up a command line um, and just CD to any workspace directory that's got you know kind of your your depot in there, all you need to do is just P4 set P4 ignore and then to whatever file. Uh, you're marking it as. And that way it just knows that it's the correct one. A lot of the time it actually uh, recognizes that automatically, uh, as long as the naming convention okay. is correct. Um, but just if you, if for some reason you don't want to call it that or mm -hmm. you want to call it something different. I think that step is outlined in the documentation as well. Yeah, the, doc, the docs are really yeah. good on, on, on a lot of this and, stuff. Uh, I, I and I linked them in chat earlier, but they will also exist on the uh, forum announcement uh, mm -hmm. thread that exists on our forums. I'll make sure I'll put all yeah. the doc links there. And also, because I mean, this is, you know, while we've, today we've used this for Unreal, it's just a, it's just a generic yeah. Yeah. Perforce server, right? Uh -huh. You can use this for literally uh, anything. any content you yeah. want, anything that you want to be versioning. Uh, you can just push this stuff up. It's once yeah. it's there, it's Image there. Edits, it doesn't. Or... It doesn't care what you're, uh, what you're, what you're putting, putting there. Um, <clears throat> so I've just got one last bit, which is just general best practices. So obviously we've been over splitting up your assets. Uh, so this is just general good recommendation. There's lots of different ways to do this inside the engine. Uh, so you know, kind of material functions, behavior trees, blah blah blah, blah all that good stuff. We can uh, share this deck, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Cool. Yeah, we'll yeah. make sure that I'll put that up as well. Um, the uh, only check out the assets you're working on. So obviously, just you know, kind of make sure you're staying on top of that stuff. Um, uh, make use of ignore files uh, just to be a bit more selective about how you're working. Uh, one thing we missed as well was the DCC. Don't put the DCC on uh, on Perforce. Uh, that should be on a separate uh, separate. Um, server, right? That you can access. Um, for anyone who's accessing that stuff, it only really makes sense to have it for local access. Um, so, uh, have we has have the DCC been ever gone over before? Um, in, or DDC, sorry. Inside Can Unreal. Derived data cache. Yeah. Oh, um, I don't think so. Not I haven't. Because it kind of popped up around four twenty two, I think. It's mm -hmm. just like a generic error that was suddenly with the engine. That's like this hasn't been set up properly. Um, but it's really useful. Um, basically, it's just taking all of your cached data. Mm -hmm. So every time it has to compile, if you're building for Xbox and PlayStation and Windows or whatever, you have to build the, you know, kind of uh, cook the content for right. each of those things. And the, the derived data cache will just store all of that stuff. And then multiple people can access it and, and, uh, and use it, which means you can really heavily reduce any compile uh, work that you're doing because that compile data is shared across mm -hmm. multiple users. Um, so yeah, don't don't put that on the Perforce server, um, but that should be going onto a shared server that's uh, that is local. Um, at the point where it's not local, it's probably not worth. No, it's going to be benefit. slower. It will be slow, it. right? So if you've got a mate who's working in Madrid or something, and you know, and you're in England or America or whatever, then it, it's not worth it. But mm -hmm. if you're a, if you're a localized team, then it's definitely worth setting up because it will save you a huge amount of time. Um, so. Uh, also, um, it's not on here as well, but there's no reason why you can't set up a Jenkins server as well. So uh, Jenkins server's kind of automation, um, which allows you to kind of like just automatically cook content and mm -hmm. deploy builds and things like that. This is something that most major studios, if not all major studios, have uh, so that they can basically just cook content, build, uh, do builds overnight or, or whatever. 
Um, again, you'd need to buy your own server or pay for server space, um, but there's some really good documentation on uh, setting up a Jenkins server and allowing you to, to deploy that content. Is that the one that also builds yeah. for you? Right. Yeah, it, yeah. Does all, it does all your building for you, so it will, it will do a live build. So mm -hmm. every time there's a change registered, it will, start it will do a new build um, of, your, of your game. So you've always got the latest build uh, accessible, uh, and it can also do a lot of Content cooking as well. I think so. I've used Team City in the past as yeah, well. Yeah, there's there, again yeah. Jenkins is just it's not a that's just a, a brand okay. right, that, that that can do it um, that I just know a lot of people use. Um, so yeah, it's, that's worth doing. Um, so yeah, uh, make sure your change lists are useful. That's a that's a big one. Why aren't we presenting? Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, just again, general security. Uh, I do not want to make tell you how to secure your server. Um, because I'm not like a, an IT professional or a server specialist or anything like that. Uh, I'm very much on the let's hack together a little perforce server mm -hmm. for fun. Uh, make sure that you're researching this stuff. Um, but just general, you know, kind of little bits of optional, you know, kind of extras that you can do. Uh, secure with an SSH, which is basically just like a big long key that means that you're, you've got much more secure passwording uh, on your actual server itself. Um, so. Uh, you can set that up. Again, DigitalOcean um, makes that really, really easy to do. Uh, and then you can also restrict IPs as well, which is, is a good idea. Um, basically means that only people uh, from set IP addresses will be able to access your server. Right? Um, so if I've got a static IP at home, you've got a static IP at home, I can add that, and that way only people from that IP yep. will be able to access it. So it's just a, a little way of securing up uh, your system. Um, but yeah, please, 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 please read up on how to secure secure this stuff. If you're putting anything that has any value uh, to you whatsoever, just make sure you you're researching this stuff. Uh, and then, last thing, right? Unreal Game Sync. Uh, so uh, this is not a small topic. <laughs> this is not a small topic. Uh, we could probably do a full talk on Unreal Game Sync and setting it up to work with Unreal Game Sync. Um, it may not be applicable to you. Uh, if you're working on standard projects, basically it's just a, a nice uh, kind of middle user interface that acts between the engine and Perforce. Uh, I think it only works with Perforce. Um, I believe so, yes. Yeah. Uh, but what it will do is it will kind of, it does a lot of cook content uh, for you. So if you have an engine build inside your Perforce repository uh, with streams of the different games that you're working on, you can very quickly move between different streams uh, and then uh, get that content and then have it cook that content for you. So it's automatically just going through and building up the engine and, and making sure it's working and then running uh, the final thing. This is really nice if you've got some, if you've got a, uh, a team where you've got some very technical people and then some people who aren't as technical, people who are, you know, kind of art, uh, key artists uh, who aren't interested in code and aren't interested in, in any of the techie stuff. They just want to be able to load up the engine like they would with uh, the launcher, mm -hmm. and just be able to put their stuff in and, and work in it. This allows them to kind of just very quickly access this stuff. It's got a few useful other things as well. Um, you can kind of vote on builds. So if someone does a build and it screws everything up, you can mark it as bad, mm -hmm. right? And then multiple people can mark it as bad. And then you can automatically sync to the last good change, which means that you can have a load of, uh, of builds above you but you know that they aren't stable or uh -huh. they're not in a good state, so you can kind of not work on those particular areas and just kind of work on the last good version that you had. Uh, and then it's got quick links to, you can uh, do asset tagging and loads of other stuff like that. So um, if you are, uh, it does require a bit of technical know-how to get set up, especially making sure that your engine and your uh, game content is all linked up correctly. Um, but if it's something that you think will be useful, then definitely have a look at it. We always, always, always recommend um, when we're doing visits to big studios to, to use this. Mm -hmm. uh, and the positive feedback that we get on it is just immense. People well, if you just look at it. the interface and the difference between that and Perforce, yeah. it's very clear how. It's nice, it's clean, it's, uh, it's easy to use, it's a bit more simple to, to, to have set up as well. Yeah, and to so teach someone how yeah. to use. Yeah. yeah, it's good. All right, we don't have a lot of time left, but we definitely have a lot of questions. Well, we're done. So yeah. let's try to uh, move through them as fast as we can. Okay. Um, I, I thought this question was kind of funny. Um, I hope they get into how to say projects with screwed up version control. 
And the it's a little, little tricky to know sort of what's going on there. Like, oh, I can't pull it no longer because something's going on with the mm -hmm. server. Um, but what I've come across in the past is that um, you something goes wrong, and because you're you're trying to do things that maybe you weren't supposed to do, and you're reverting and rolling back this file and not that one. Yeah. Someone forgot to check out, and they're no longer on the team, and you don't really know how to use the admin. You can always, always, always take your local copy. Set it all to be writable, and then push it back up on the server again. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I've, mean, I've had to do in the past. It's yeah. not beautiful. It's not great because yes, you do, you will lose all the history changes. But you know, if everything fails, you still have whatever was the last thing you pulled on your PC. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe what you come across is that like, oh, I can't save it and I can't check it out because version control is done. Um, just right-click the folder and make it writable. Mm -hmm. I found as well that you can have some. You can have issues with if you've deleted content. But you haven't oh, done it. Yeah. The the right way that Perforce wants you to delete content, you, you can have some some issues with that. Mm -hmm. So every now and then you'll you'll have to kind of re-download a load of content that you've already deleted and then manually mark it as as for delete mm -hmm. and, and go through and, and remove that content. Uh, so yeah, there's absolutely loads of ways that you can screw up uh, screw up your Perforce thing. But it's also it lots of ways to fix it. Uh, yeah, there's also yeah there are a lot of ways to fix it. You know, kind of you've got you've got all the history. Um, a lot of the time, it's just about picking a thing, right? It's about choosing between one or multiple versions mm -hmm. of a particular thing that is in conflict with the other. And a lot of the time, you just resolve it by picking the, the thing that you want, and then it will go through and it will, it will sort itself out. Let's see. So I know we're getting into something that might be a little bit above our knowledge here, but <laughs> um, when distributing a custom engine build to artists and developers, we currently use Perforce Streams. Okay. Um, and he's mentioning that they have some limitations, not be n like not being linked to the launcher. Um, is there a way to distribute engine builds to developers that retains launcher and marketplace integration? As um, far as I know, my custom my custom engine builds actually do show up as an option so in the launcher, but I don't know if the marketplace ties into them. However. I almost never, ever, ever pull down Marketplace content straight into the project that no, I'm working yeah, on. That's not a good workflow because there's probably a lot of stuff in there that you don't want. And if you do that on Perforce, it's going to go, oh, look at all these new files. Do you want to push them? And you might. So I don't know what magic you set up, but mine doesn't show engine. But it does show your project. So your, your project should all, uh, the That's, launcher yes. should detect any projects that are sitting on the computer, mm -hmm. and it should display them. So you can access them through through that way, um, and then all, all you can load up your project from there, um, just not the particular uh, engine. Yeah, we're pushing the the plugin or the marketplace assets. It's yeah. the way I always have a project I call marketplace migrate, mm. and I have one for almost every engine version. Yeah, I, and I, I will do the just. Same. Usually leave it in there. I mean, it, it's also cached in the vault, mm -hmm. um, so you can actually delete it from the vault and then just keep it in that project, put it in a hard drive. Yeah. You know, I, I always have to do a bit of marketplace cleanup, um, not not necessarily because the the creator has done it wrong. A lot of the time, it's just because they've done it differently to how I like the setup to be. So I do the same thing. I just put it into a an and empty project want... folder. I sort it all out and then I migrate it over to the to the particular project I'm working. Yeah, on. and you might not want all. 300 different kinds of chairs yeah. that came with your Archer's pack, yeah, right? Yeah. You might just want <laughs> one. Um, and then trying to keep your project less bloated will also save you space on the server, takes mm -hmm. less time. If someone new comes on the project, it might be a much quicker pull. Yeah. Um, is that, uh, OK, I think they're mentioning the, um, the UDN license. If it's a custom license on the Unreal side or on the Perforce side, it's, it's an Unreal on Epic side. Um, yeah. You get that license with us. Well, the, it, yeah, the, so you have to have a license for Perforce mm -hmm. if you're using more than five users. That's just Perforce. That, but if you want to access our, uh, we have our own server of Unreal builds that you can that you can get access to. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you want to get access to those, and that yeah, at that point you have to get uh, a, a custom license. If you want to do that, um, we've got a, a, a link on our uh, website where you can go if you're interested in becoming a custom licensee. Um, obviously, we we don't discuss uh, terms face to face. You have to you know kind of sign uh, an MNDA first. But if you're interested in doing that, then definitely reach out to us. Um, yeah, there's plenty because, of people because yeah. you know kind of we do all that stuff and uh, and and yeah, it's you know it can be it can be so useful. The things that you can get from having a custom license uh, are massively massively beneficial. Is uh, Perforce centralized like Subversion? 
Yes. Yeah. But you can also actually do a local um, local depot. Mm -hmm. That's I think the other one, the personal option when you yeah set up yeah. So login. if you open up uh, if you open up P four V, I'll just close it. Uh, you can because you can set up the uh, P four D. I think it's called, which l allows you to establish a server on your own computer. Okay. Um, I haven't done it. I just know that no, it is I, possible. I, yeah, I haven't done it. So yeah, you can set up a personal. Uh, personal server access as well. Yeah, it says a local uh, Helix then, server. Yeah, and then you can just remote on. Um, how do AAA studios manage source control without merging blueprints then? Um, all you're going to have is conflict all around your branches. Um, I guess we, we didn't talk too much about branching, mm -hmm. um, mainly because as, as far as we know here internally, we mostly work with streams yeah. because of the fact that they can have um, interdependencies between them. Um, we. And so in that regard, when I've been on a larger team, what we do is that we essentially never work on the same blueprints. And we try mm -hmm. to split up the work as much as possible, right? Yeah. And you're owning a small section of the larger uh, framework. So yeah, so what a lot of people do is they'll have, um, they'll have just a, a, a rule in place. And this will either be just a company-wide rule, uh, or it will be a, 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 an extra piece of software or an extra piece of logic uh, that means that if you have branches and you're working across branches, any binary files, if they're checked out on any branch, they're checked out on all branches, mm -hmm. right? So um, at that point, any binary file is, uh, is basically can't be branched, right? You, you basically are working on the file mm -hmm. for it. Uh, and you can have branches of code within that, but anything that is you know, kind of uh, binary will, uh, will not adhere to the branch rule. And so if you have several programmers that are going to work, you know, needs to work simultaneously on something, mm -hmm. blueprints might not be the right choice for those objects. Yeah. Um, and you might want to do it in code and then just expose whatever you need to the designers or the artists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, branching is a really tricky one. Um, I mean, I just don't, I don't think it, uh, we really do it at Epic anymore. I mean, Fortnite's a very, very, very big game. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we have a, you should look at uh, Ben Ma. Ben Marsh, Marsh did a did a talk on uh, on how we kind of uh, operate on Fortnite. It's definitely worth uh, watching um, if you haven't already. And I think he does briefly mention uh, Robo Merge. Yes, he does. Um, which is kind of the internal tool that we have uh, for for kind of managing um, those particular potential. So issues. I'm going to link this. I'm glad you mentioned it because yeah. this is a literally. It's a really it's an amazing talk yeah. generally. So you should definitely go and watch it, even if you're, um, you know, even if you just. Did, interested in games development generally rather than yeah. actual performance. The talk is called things. Tools and Infrastructure yeah. for Large Teams. That's yeah. And he goes over that. Um, so I'll make sure I'll put that in the uh, forum announcement notes as well. But I think everyone runs into uh, everyone runs into these issues with, you know, kind of with blueprints and needing to uh, needing to needing to branch out. And I think people are starting to just work around uh, work around those. Um, they're very difficult things to to do it's like a texture right it's like yeah would you open up both and then just paint out which bits you wanted to keep and not keep it's yeah it's that, that'd be tricky let's see we don't have time I'm, we're definitely not going to go through all of these <laughs> uh we'll have to i talked for too long no it's good it's, it's all good, <laughs> good knowledge uh, but there's definitely also a lot of questions which is good it means that this is a topic that you know needs to be addressed and, yeah. and talked about uh some of them we can try to follow up on the forum afterwards mm -hmm. um yeah i can, can. i'll jump on um, yeah let's, let's pick two more and then, then we'll have to round up um as a tech artist what sort of version control work do you tend to do uh okay um i mean my general workflow is uh, is sticking Inside the is inside the engine, so I I, I never work on uh, on code stuff. So I'm always doing, you know, kind of either blueprints or shaders or you know, kind of basically my remit kept on expanding to to basically include anything that's inside <laughs> Unreal. Uh, even though I'm a tech artist, I still do a lot on you know, kind of behavior trees and AI mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So uh, so yeah, kind of for me, version control uh, is just a way of of keeping backup of my work and, and going through. A lot of the time, I'm working on my own on particular projects. Uh, so I'm not using it for, um, for working with lots of people. I'm using it as a, as a personal um, device for just keeping my work backed up and for being able to uh, go back if something, if something ever goes wrong. Um, I like to use it to just go down a particular thought process. So I'll be 
doing things in a particular way and I'll be working on a particular demo or a particular prototype or whatever. And I can go quite far down a rabbit hole and realize that it's just the wrong way of doing it. And at that point, I'll just revert back and, and start going down another, mm -hmm. another path, which again is, uh, is branching, but um, because I'm working on my own, I don't need to worry about that, uh, that avenue so I can just make that decision. Um, but yeah. There are a few questions about um, why not using Git LFS, since that is um, available now. It's the Git, the large file system, which allows you to do large files. Mm. Um, you still can't check out, as far as I know. No, Git still doesn't. Yeah, th there's just some somewhere. fundamental problems there when you're mm. working with the kind of file types that we that we have in the game engine. Uh, you can. You just need to pay a lot of attention to what's going on in the project and who's doing what. Yeah. And when. Yeah, if you if you've ever worked. Uh, with just Git as a as an artist on a team, you'll you'll very quickly understand why it's just not workable. People end up having to have just these mountains of Post-it notes, where it's just like, okay, if I have the hammer Post-it note, that means that no one else can work on it, and you have to go to the board and and take like the. It's just it's an archaic mm -hmm. uh, way of working, and and having checkout is just is so useful for people who are working on uh, on binary files that. You can't work any other way. Um, trying to grab if there were some really nice questions here in the end we could talk about. Um, do I have to check out every file again after I did a commit? Um, not unless you don't want to work on it yeah, again. No. Yeah. You only check it out when you're working on it. Once you're done with it, you push it back to the server. And then it's locked. Uh, and, then that's, and then it's right. locked again until you want to access it. You can always access all the files. Mm -hmm. um, you know, There's no point at which you can't see it, even if it's been checked out by someone else. It's just the case that you can't actually do work on it. Cool. I think that's it. We're okay. almost at the two-hour mark. Almost. We've been talking for two hours. Um, technically, there's a bit of the news and intro as well, <laughs> which is um, okay. about four to seven minutes. Yeah. Um, so, but we've definitely been here for quite some time. Awesome. Aaron, thanks for coming, Thank you showing off all of these things. Um, we will be back next week, and we actually have Pasquale Cianti, the lead designer on who uh, helped Epic get out helped Epic out on our, uh, our ray trace, ray trace Artris sample that you can get on the Learn tab. Uh, if you want to get a little bit prepared and check that out, you can do that before next week's stream. Um, he's he's going to be calling in from Florida, talking to us about um, his thought process behind the project and how how he made such an incredibly beautiful looking it looks, scene. It was not him alone, it looks but he, yeah. he definitely had a big... Um, a big impact on on the project. Um, as always, make sure you check out our meetup pages. We got user groups all around the world. Some of them where you can find Aaron. Hopefully, me this year. At least that's the plan. Um, make sure you submit uh, everything you're working on to us. Let us know what you're doing. Uh, you might be featured in our community spotlight. Um, countdown videos. We just got another one actually just today. Very happy. We're probably going to be playing it next week. Um, take 30 minutes of development. Speed it up to five minutes. Send that in to us together with a separate logo. Uh, we will composite them together, and your game might be featured uh, as a countdown on the stream. Uh, as always, follow us on social media and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Going through all the things there, trying to make it uh, not hit the two hour mark. Um, also, remember the transcript. If you had an issue hearing what we said or specifically what we were talking about, or even if you wanted to find something that you remember we talked about, but during these two hours, you might not know where in the stream they are, you can go ahead in a couple of days. We always upload a transcript file in the YouTube description. You can go ahead and control F that, and the timestamp is right there, and you can go ahead and find a section of the stream where we talked about revert or branching or streams or merge or shaders or, you know, um, you name it. Uh, and as always, I'm not going to forget to tell you that you should fill out this survey that we have. Let us know what you want to see in the future, what we did well, what we didn't do so well. Um, maybe we should have, I don't know, made bigger blobs instead of squashing the blobs. <laughs> Anything you want to point out to us, uh, we always want to know what you think. So please let us know. And then until next time, Aaron's here because you're definitely coming back. I think oh, we had a yeah, great time. I, people have asked me to do some shader stuff. You're going to come here so. and you're going to do some shader <laughs> stuff. Yep. Um, and possibly it might be even be a, a kind of an exciting project later. Yeah. Yeah. No, we'll see. And that's it for today, everyone. Thanks for sticking around. If you're here for the entire time, we will see you next week. And until then, have a great time and happy development. Bye, everyone. Bye.